The fact is, there's good reason for us to be both frustrated and excited. We know that as we go forward after today, that we hold with us what happened coming off of the Seneca Falls Women's Convention, the workplace reforms that came after the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory tragedy, the fact that we legalized abortion before Roe versus Wade, the Stonewall riots and so much more have, have, pa have paved the path forward thanks to the work of so many activists in this room and so many of those who've come before us. I'd like to say, and I think it's correct to say, that if you're in this room, you understand, as we all understand, that all of these basic rights and liberties are interconnected, whether it's women's equality, reproductive freedom, LGBTQ rights, workers' rights, immigrants' rights, economic justice. These are not single issues. We know they are interrelated, fundamental concerns that are essential if we're going to have a progressive New York, a progressive nation, and a progressive world. There is no more perfect illustration of that than this conference and all of your work together. Unfortunately, there's also no greater illustration of the fact that we sometimes, all too often these days, bump up against the exact same roadblocks no matter what community we are in or what issues we are fighting for. And I, would, I am here today to remind you something I'm sure you've heard a lot this weekend, but I cannot have you leave today without underscoring that for the last two years we have had progress in this state stymied by the state senate where we had a controlling majority and I use those quotation marks purposefully of the Senate Republican Conference aided and abetted by the Independent Democratic Caucus and they have, as so many of you know, been the bulwark. They have been the blockage. They have been an impenetrable wall to so many progressive reforms that would make this state better for all of us. Now, I got to tell you, I wouldn't do this work and wouldn't have been doing it as long as I have if I weren't an optimist. And I see in that wall of frustration an enormous opportunity it has given us to create a united front, and to make the connections in the field, on the ground, every day that we hold so dear in our heads and in our hearts. It's why NARAL Pro-Choice New York jumped at the chance to participate in the Collaborating to Win efforts this past year, right? Amazing work, everybody. Seriously, talk about holding people accountable. They never knew when we were coming, and they were scared, and that was good. That's the way it should be. It's why it is so important that Citizen Action and the Working Families Party are taking the lead as we go into this next election to forge the kind of broad coalition that can change the New York State Senate so that it actually looks and reflects and represents and works for all New Yorkers. Now, not surprising to anyone in this room when that coalition is being forged is to see at the top of that agenda things like the DREAM Act and minimum wage and fair elections and the Women's Equality Act. Now, comes as no surprise to me, but it might have come to surprise to some, and let me tell you why. How often have we seen women's issues over here and those economic issues over there, right? Women's issues, social issues are kind of in this side of the equation and everything else is over here. Make no mistake, that is about dividing us. That is not about getting any of these things done. And we know that and understand it, and that is why all of those things are at the front of the agenda. Now, the good, I have a little good news, too, because I think it's important to keep that optimism going. We know that New Yorkers want to see the Women's Equality Act passed. We've known it for two years. There's more than 75% support. This is no surprise to any of us. So we thought, let's dig a little deeper. Let's take a look at whether the vast majority of New Yorkers who want to see the Women's Equality Act and so many more of these progressive reforms that we could get done with a new state Senate, do they make the connections that we all do? I had a sneaking suspicion they do, and guess what? There's really good news. We have just done some statewide polling, 
And we found that those connections, for instance, between those issues that when you think of narrow pro-choice New York come naturally to mind, right? Access to abortion, safe legal abortion, ability to access affordable contraception, ability to protect yourself against sexually transmitted infections. All of that and the economic status of a woman and her family actually are connected in people's minds. They really are. Now, not surprising to us, right? We hold that. But the vast majority of New Yorkers, as it turns out, seven in 10 New Yorkers, without us running a campaign even, we haven't even started the campaign, right? We already got seven in 10. They know, they recognize and agree that having access to legal abortion can enable a woman to be more financially secure and to take care of her family. I mean, you kind of think, no, duh. But really, not necessarily the conversation that usually happens. And yet, we've got the majority of people in this state understanding it. They recognize that a woman's ability to control whether and when to have a child affects her opportunities in the workplace and in her life. And I gotta tell you the thing that really blew my mind, but again, shouldn't have, is that when we gave people an opportunity just to tell us, we did, you know, this was a poll, we wanted to give them a chance to speak without us asking a lot of questions, we said, tell us the single most important thing that you think affects a woman's ability to have opportunities equal to a man in this, in this state. Guess what they said? They said having, being a mother, or being a primary caregiver to a child is the single most important question you need to understand in terms of whether a woman's gonna have equal opportunity. Now, again, not something that surprises those of us in this room, because we believe that and we understand that, but most New Yorkers understand it too. Because we know in real life, it shows that your economic station, your ability to take care of your family, your ability to have opportunity, is intertwined with, particularly for women, and dependent upon whether you can make your own decisions about your reproductive life and your reproductive health. It shows that that future is connected, that economic future, that family's future, that woman's future. Now, we too and our future is connected. It's why I'm so thrilled to be here today. It's why I know that we will in fact see progress in this great state. And that interconnectedness and that working together is the other reason I'm so happy to be here. And that is to be able to turn the podium over to a fearless leader and a stalwart partner in our collective fight for justice, Elise Hogue, the president of NARAL Pro-Choice America. I, I wanna give Elise as much time as possible, um, but I did wanna give you a few highlights which I think you will, see, you will see underscored in what she has to say. Not surprisingly, she's devoted her career to organizing for social justice, whether that's environmental sustainability, media accountability and reform, human rights, reproductive freedom, and so much more. She's particularly recognized for doing unbelievably important pioneering work in the digital world, and I have a sneaking suspicion you'll hear some, you'll see some of that in a moment, including using cutting edge online strategies to not just harness, but build the power of organizations like moveon.org. She's an expert in advocacy and electoral campaigns, which I know is very important to all of us here, and truly an inspiration to so many progressive activists across the country. And last but not least, I think we are all very fortunate that she is willing and more than able to take on the most recalcitrant, reactionary pundits and politicos on the airwaves pretty much any day of the week you ask. Thank you for that. Please join me in welcoming Elise to the stage. Are y'all having a good conference? I think I can wander, right? I don't need to stand over here. I'm good. Y'all can you hear me? Is everyone having a good conference? Yeah. Um, I'm going to say a couple things before I actually get started. Um, one, y'all are rocking New York, and I know it feels hard, and I know it feels like there's barrier after barrier, and I've learned a lot about this independent thing in your Senate that's a problem. But I am telling you, I am a Texan. I am fourth generation Texan. And there are a lot of people that look down there to up here for what justice and equality looks like. So y'all are the leading edge, and it matters to the rest of this country, which is why we have to support you in continuing to fight. Here's the other thing I'm going to tell you. Um, 
A couple weeks ago, I had to, or I had the honor of following a United States Senator. I'm not gonna tell you who, because y'all are gonna tweet it and get me in trouble on stage. I will follow any United States Senator on stage over those guys, because they were so good. It's so intimidating. One more round of applause for Poets for Peace. I am blessed and privileged by their gospel that they spoke up here. I really, really am. It's an honor. It's an honor. So, um, boring title. We're going to get past that. Um, I'm just going to speak my truth. I spoke my truth at a conference a couple months ago, and one of the Citizen Action guys happened to be there and asked if I would come speak it here. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm Elise. I'm a woman. I'm a woman-born woman. -born woman. Um, I spent, as Andrea said, a lot of my personal and professional career working on all sorts of issues of social justice, environmental justice, human rights. Uh, I worked on campaign finance reform, did some of that here in New York in 2012. Um, I have done a lot of different work. Um, in the last decade, I actually, as Andrea mentioned, let me see if I can get this thing right, did a lot of that at moveon.org. Um, I was a communications director and political director there, and I learned a lot about the power of the internet to lower barrier of entry for people to make their voices heard. I learned a lot about the power of the internet to aggregate action and small dollar donors that can actually give our candidates opportunity to represent and compete. And I learned a lot about the power of the internet to just educate and empower folks who feel real alienated from the current political system. Um, mostly what I learned after years of being an organizer is that the internet makes us even bigger organizers at scale, right? That all it does is show us that the sum is greater than the whole of its parts, which we already know, because we're already organizing here. But scale is important. And I learned that. I learned that on a bunch of different issues, financial reform, health care, climate change. Since February 1st, 2013, I have been an advocate for women's rights, specifically for abortion access, contraception access, accurate sex education, and the hands of our young people so we can all make informed decisions about when and how we have families. Since February 1st, 2013, I've learned some other things about the internet. I've learned apparently now I'm really a woman because despite the fact that every single one of these issues that I work on affects everybody of every gender everywhere around the world, it's still mostly women's work. Women done by women for women. And this is new for me. Being, being a, defined as a women's activist, being defined professionally by my gender, being a poster child for gender issues, and what comes with it, which is being the subject of ridicule, marginalization, othering. Some of y'all know about this in this room, right? It doesn't only happen to women. Um, now, one of the things that I have spent a lot of time thinking about is this word called stigma, right? Stigma is this pathologizing of anything we think is other than us to keep us down. Now, I already knew what stigma was, I just didn't use the word that much, because I'm a woman. We already covered that, right? I'm a woman. So, of course, I've been harassed on the street, hit glass ceilings, been mansplained to, had my ideas wrapped up in different words and presented five minutes later in a meeting by a guy to a round of applause, right? Of Y'all have never had that happen, right? Yeah. <laughs> Of course, I know my one in five every two minutes, 38% by a friend or acquaintance victims of sexual assault. Of course, I know my one in three, I think it's probably more, women who have accessed abortion, had an abortion because something was wrong, or the condom broke, or the pill failed, or you just screwed up one night and thought it would be okay and then it wasn't. Of course, I know my six in 10 of those one in three that are already moms struggling to get along with the family that they have, with jobs that don't pay enough, and childcare that's inadequate. 
So I know what it is to feel stigma. But now I know in my job the death threats, the comparisons to genocidal maniacs, the running tallies of unborn souls I have killed because I hold the radical belief that women know best, better than politicians, when and how we should have families, and that control over our own body is fundamentally to, fundamental to our equality, and that if we can't be equal, we can never have justice. Now I know that being the face of the, this organization means my days of hushed tones in the corners, talking about all that stuff I just talked about with you guys that you've talked in hushed corners and bars with friends because you don't want your boss to know or your family to know, those days are over because I'm the face now of an organization that advocates for these things. And the thing that I have learned the most is that stigma has concentric circles the smallest of which houses a tiny judge that lives inside of us and if we allow it, does society's business for it. When I retreated to the internet after taking this job, this place that was really familiar to me where I thought, ah, all right, I know how to do this, I can get empowered. What I actually found is that stigma doesn't stop at the pearly gates of the internet. In fact, the University of Maryland did a study that showed, they created all of these online personas and they released them out there onto the interwebs. And what they found is that male sounding names got 3.7 sexually explicit harassing messages a day. Anyone want to take bets on the next one? Female sounding names got 100 sexually explicit harassing messages a day, right? goes everywhere. Working to halt abuse online found that 72.5% of reported online harassment is at women. It's real, it's pervasive, it costs time, it costs energy, it costs money, and it costs mental anguish for those of us that are dealing with it. Now believe it or not, that is not what I am here to talk about. There are lots of talks about that and you can spend an entire hour on it. But the talk that I gave a couple months ago that Charlie saw and asked me to come give here was actually the opposite. It was about stigma jujitsu and how the internet saves. Because here's what I've learned. The secret of stigma, stigma is kryptonite, if you will, is that it thrives on isolation and it withers when it's exposed. And the virtual commons, while it's surfaced all of the hatred, it's also made its exposure safer more powerful and exponentially more valid. There was a tragedy early this year in Santa Barbara where a man went out and shot a lot of people, not just women, but he did it grounded in a misogynist rant. Y'all remember that? Immediately online, there was an outpouring. Yes, all women. Yes, all women, because the media will mourn the lives of Roy high school football players, but not of the girls they assaulted, right? Yes, all women, I tweeted, because my husband, who I love, does not get why I don't think it's fun to walk down dark alleys at night. Yes, all women was actually predated two years ago by something in England called I did not report. I did not report being sexually assaulted as a 12-year-old because I didn't know it was an option. A year later, he raped my friend. Absolutely nothing but blame was placed on me after my first two assaults. I did not report the most recent. Couldn't go through that again. The woman who started I Do Not Report said, where it's easy for commenters to dismiss one woman as a liar, it's harder to dismiss thousands of accounts. And there they were, right? We saw that with Yes All Women. Because when I want to call out somebody for making a sexist joke or comment online, I worry I'll burn all professional bridges. Yes All Women. There were hundreds of thousands of Yes All Women tweets in the wake of UC Santa Barbara. You know what else there were? Not all men. 
as though we need to be told that not all men do all these bad things, as though we need to be told that our husbands, our brothers, our fathers are good guys, right? As though not all men means that that's okay what's happening to women. But that's not what happened. A man did this in the wake of not all men. I don't know if y'all can see it, but it was great. He created an online comic that said, the man signal, someone must be doing reverse sexism. This misandrous is no match for it. not all man, defender of the defended, the lone protector of the protected, voice of the voiceful. <laughs> this got tweeted out at anyone tweeting not all men. And it was a really good reminder that the virtual comments can use humor to disarm and lift up the voices of those who need to be heard. So the virtual commons is large, and we know that it can create choruses out of isolated voices. But what of the microcosm, the small towns in America where sometimes these abuses go unnoticed? Enter Caitlin Campbell, small town in West Virginia, who was forced to sit through a sex education class that was all abstinence only. And she spoke out about it. She said, we're seniors in high school. We actually need the real resources and tools that allow us to make empowered decision making so that we know what we're getting into. Her high school principal called her into his office and said, you're a troublemaker. Shut your mouth, or I will call every college that you applied to and tell them not to admit you. Did Caitlin Campbell shush? No. Nope. She did not. She took to social media and Twitter, and she told her story, and it got picked up, and this was tweeted the next day. Wellesley College, Caitlin Campbell. Wellesley is excited to welcome you to this call. And a small town principal got what he deserved by being called out in national press. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't talk here about the role of feminist blogs in lifting up these voices. The mainstream media was not giving voice to these abuses, so we created our own, just like people all over have started to create their own media. Jezebel, Feministing, RH Reality Check. These are online media sites that have made sure these stories got out and got told. Like, yes, clap for that. That's important. And they're not alone. There are lots of other ones. So this is uh, a story about, um, sorry, I got lost. This is a story about Lindsay Stockton in Canada, who got told to go home and put on a shirt with sleeves and a skirt that covered her knees, even though it was really, really hot out. She put, instead of going home, she put up signs all over school saying, don't humiliate her because she's wearing shorts. It's hot outside. Instead of shaming girls for their bodies, teach boys that girls are not sexual objects. <laughs> Those signs lasted 20 minutes, right? Anyone can walk around and tear down signs. But Jeze not before Jezebel got the story. And this story resulted in a school board hearing and the policy being changed. So this is about some of the easier issues we deal with, and they're not easy. Slut shaming, sex ed. What about abortion? What we're told is the third rail of politics, right? Well, enter Emily Letts. Emily Letts is a courageous young woman who worked at an abortion clinic, still works at an abortion clinic, I believe, and uh, found herself pregnant. And she decided that she was going to film her abortion, which she did. As I like to say, all three and a half very, very boring minutes of it, because if anyone's ever been through it, it's a very short, quick medical procedure, just like so many other short, quick medical procedures that happen on a daily basis. Now, Emily was subject to an enormous amount of hatred online, right? But one of the things that was interesting is that the vocal minority that really tries to scare women off from telling their stories did something different with this video. They told people not to watch it. 
because it was too scary and too horrible to watch. Now, why did they do that? No, to get people, they were afraid people would watch it and see that their misinformation about what a horrible invasive surgical procedure this is would all be gone in one minute. And what Emily tells us is she did this because there's so much shame. And although she heard all that hatred, she heard so many more people saying thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for giving us accurate information about what our choices are. And, oh, sorry, and she's gone on to do wonderful, ah, there, wonderful um, work helping women share their stories free from stigma and shame. So this is something that we did because we thought in particularly before and after Emily's story, um, not enough for women to tell our stories, right? Solidarity is a key principle of progressive values and progressive advancement. So we thought these are not just issues for women. So we created a Mem for Choice hashtag. It's very funny, I clipped this um, before the last <laughs> talk and I noticed this morning when I was going over it that it's one of your state senators that I don't even know who actually happened to tweet <laughs> on this Mem for Choice blog, which I did not know. Um, but we got hundreds of thousands of tweets under our Mem for Choice hashtag over the last year and so many men saying, thanks for giving us an opportunity to demonstrate visibly our support for women and their ability to make these choices, our ability to make these choices. So that's about personal stories, and that's really important, but we're not in this for personal stories. We're in this for structural change, right? We need impact. We need people to be helped. So I have a couple examples where I got really excited over the past year. I'm from Texas. Texas is in a crisis, people, a crisis. Clinics are being closed left and right. In fact, another clinic was just closed this week. Um, when the court decision came down, upholding, I, I won't get into the intricate legalities, but upholding um, the state law that meant that clinics were gonna close and a dozen closed overnight, tens of thousands of women were left without appointments. Am I ignoring this side of the room? Tens of thousands of women were left without appointments immediately. Immediately, imagine, right? Imagine you're facing a challenging decision, you've gone through your process, you made your appointment, you got your money together, you got your transportation, and you find out the night before that your clinic is closed. We teamed up with NNAF and Lady Parch Justice, which if you guys know Liz Winstead, that is her group, and we did the first only online telethon with comedians and singers to raise money for these women. We raised, we streamed out for three hours and raised $56,000 overnight so women could travel to places where they could have appointments. That's real change. That matters to real people. And that is the power of our ability to be online. All right, this is another example of structural change. Anyone remember when Twitter changed their blocking policy? This was a very big deal in the feminist. Feminists were being harassed insanely on Twitter, lives threatened openly, right? And the one thing we can do is block our harassers from seeing our Twitter feeds. That is the one thing we can do and block, that, block us from seeing them, but block them from seeing us. Twitter unilaterally said, you know what? We're gonna change our policy and what we're gonna do is make it so you can't see them saying horrible things to you, but they can still see you, right? So if somebody's threatening to kill me and I'm going out to the store and gonna tweet that I'm going to the store, how am I safer if I can't see him, but he can see me, right? Somebody tweeted about this, that um, it was similar to a home security system putting a blindfold on you inside your own house. A storm erupted on Twitter within hours of them handing that decision down. Organizing happened on social media all over the place and Twitter reversed its decision and apologized for the anguish that it had caused. So this is another example of structural change happening by surfacing the voices 
making clear that there are real perpetrators out there, isolating them, and demanding real action. So does this only happen to women? No, no. Harassment doesn't only happen to women. Stigma doesn't only happen to women. And the use of the internet to actually eradicate stigma and change, shame certainly doesn't only happen to women. And I always think, when I think about this topic, about the It Gets Better project. Y'all remember that? The It Gets Better project was so fascinating because it was people who had felt stigma and shame reminding younger people feeling stigma and shame that it wasn't always going to be that way, right? It gets better. But the thing about it is it was so pervasive that it had an effect that forced people to take a side. And I always think of my crazy, everyone's got the crazy uncle, right? I've got the crazy uncle in Texas who said to me, right after the It Gets Better campaign made national news, he said, you know, I still, I still don't know where I am on this whole gay marriage thing, but I know I don't want to stand with those people who are making young kids kill themselves. And that was the power of the It Gets Better campaign and giving hope and giving voice to what lives look like when they're allowed to live free of stigma and shame. And what's this? Anyone heard of Upworthy? Fastest growing media company in the world. 55 million unique viewers a month. This is a really neat project that the AFL-CIO did with Upworthy to talk about working people's issues, right? Because one of the things that we know when the economy turned down, that there was a lot of shame and stigma of people who couldn't get jobs, right? That's upside down. That's twisted and turned, right? Like, we know why people couldn't get jobs, and it sure as hell wasn't all their fault. But the individuals felt a lot of shame. So what the AFL did was team up with Upworthy and actually talk about personal stories, but get them in front of millions of people about why you can't get a job. My favorite one is how going to school, working for a living, and raising a family can all fall apart in one afternoon, right? right? Yeah. This could happen to anyone. And when these stories get out, get out, it makes a difference. What about Occupy Our Homes? Y'all remember that? Same thing. You lose your home, how do you feel? Worthless. Shame. Occupy Our Homes did a tremendous service not only by providing recourse and action, right? I was in Atlanta. I knew where I could go to help somebody keep their home, but by putting a name and a face and a story to every individual that those giant banks were kicking out of their home and telling me how I could help them. Erase the st stigma, give stories that are not shameful to people and provide action, and that's how we win. So, this is one of my favorite, we also have a project with Upworthy, and this is one of my favorite cartoons um, as we wrap up that I wanted to leave you guys with, because this goes to the recent decision that the Supreme Court says I have to go ask my boss um, if he wants to cover my birth control. And um, fortunately, I am my boss, and I think that I can have birth control, so that works pretty well. But. Not everybody. That doesn't work for everybody. So this, um, anyone seen this modern world? The commentator saying, and we're back. I'm here live with the young woman acknowledges using birth control. Tell me, are you a mother who already has enough children? No, I'm, a, I'm not a parent. Well then, perhaps you're a young wife postponing, uh, postponing parenthood until you're financially secure. No, I'm not married. I'm so sorry, you must have some sort of medical condition necessitating the use of the pill. No, no, I'm fine, really. Then I don't understand. Why do you use birth control? Er, because I enjoy sex. Aren't you afraid people will think you're a, a healthy human being? I'm okay with that, right? <laughs> This has been one of our most popular pieces of content. This has been shared almost 300,000 times on social media. And why? Why? Because it gets at the heart of the shame and the stigma, which is where we start in this conversation, which is that there's something wrong with women being 
sexual if they're not going to have kids. And, you know, I'm going to end where Andrea started. When I was thinking about coming here and talking to you guys with my history and what I do now and what y'all are focused on now, one of the things that's become really clear to me is if we don't expose this, if we don't actually talk about the fact that this is what underlies all of the regressive laws that they are trying to push in this country, we are going to continue to be separated. Because what I hear all the time since I took this job is, oh, you know what, I'm going to skip this right now. What I hear all this, the time is the false dichotomy. It's we are playing on the oppressor's storytelling playing field. And that's reproductive freedom and abortion access. Those are social issues. Andrea already said this, but I'm going to underscore it. Voters, they care about jobs and the economy. You tell me, any woman in this room, how that is separate for you. And more and more middle class and working class families dependent on two paychecks. You don't get to choose when you enter and exit the workplace to have a kid. We got no pregnancy discrimination protection in this country. We have no paid paternal leave. We have, pardon me, shit for child care, right? We don't have high enough minimum wage, and we don't have real access to contraception, information about how we might get knocked up and recourse if we do. How are these things separate? They're not. They're absolutely not. There is no such thing as economic security for women in this country without reproductive freedom, and there is no such thing as reproductive freedom in this country without economic security. And if you don't believe me, anyone know who this is? Shanisha Taylor in Arizona. What was she jailed for? Trying to take care of her family under impossible conditions. She needed to go for a job interview. She didn't have family who could help. She left her kids in the car for an hour. They were taken away from her, and she was put in jail. How is that reproductive freedom? How is that access to economic security? How is that not all our fight? Shanisha's Taylor is the nexus of where all of our issues come together. And if we allow old ideas about shameful, what's shameful, and that women are stigmatized, or people of color are stigmatized, or people who lose their house are stigmatized. That is the way that they keep us divided. And we're not going to have it anymore. The women's equality agenda, I know, is something that Citizen Action of New York has supported. And I can tell you, as a leader of a reproductive rights organization in this country, we are supporting an economic agenda because we are one and the same. Together we rise, divided we fall. Thank you very much.